A good afternoon to you. A very good afternoon to you members from across the region. Welcome to this webinar on the rule of law. Uh, I hope you can all hear me and see me. Today, we are going to have a very um, informative discussion. The rule of law and good governance and respect for human rights, a fundamental principle established under the treaty for the establishment of the East African community. The treaty mentions the word rule of law at least five times, which shows the extent to which it is a critical and necessary requirement in the community's quest to fully integrate. Besides being one of the basic requirements that any country applying for membership to the community needs to fulfill, the rule of law is also one of the identified fundamental and operational principles that the East Africa partner states undertake to observe all the time while attempting to achieve the objectives of the community. Indeed, to reflect the seriousness of the partner states attached to the rule of law, the treaty states categorically that any breach or infringement of the rule of law by any partner state may be referred to the East Africa Court of Justice for determination. This, in line with that, the East African community is witnessing increased deterioration in the rule of law, good governance, and respect for human rights. I believe we can all attest to that. This is manifested in, among others, regular fraudulent and violent election, resistance to peaceful transfer of power from one government to another, endemic corruption, insecurity, and chronic conflict, the growing threat of international terrorism, pervasive violation in fundamental rights and freedoms, and the persistent attack on media freedoms. As a result, the East Africa Law Society deemed it fit to set up a rule of law committee so as to address some of these issues within, within, the, within the society. This afternoon, we are joined, delighted to be joined by presidents from across the region, from the six countries in the region, to us about the rule of law. Our, I'll start by introducing our keynote speaker, who is Professor Fred Sembekwa, who also sits as the chairman of the Rule of Law Committee. Professor Prof is a founding senior partner of KATS Advocates. He has achieved combined success in the academic and practice arena. He has not only participated in groundbreaking litigation, he appeared in the first case brought before the newly instituted East African Courts of Justice. He has also been instrumental in numerous laws in Uganda. As a celebrated professor of law at Makerere University and the University of Dar es Salaam in Zambia, he has truly reached the pinnacle area. Prof was a member of the 1995 Constitution Commission, which helped draft the 1990 Constitution of the Republic of Uganda. He also sat as the chairperson. He also sat as the chairperson of the of the said commission. I must say that as a committee, we are truly honored and lucky to have him as our chair. Prof, we look forward to your presentation this afternoon. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. I will spend time about 20 minutes to talk about the rule of law uh, in a, a way of introducing uh, our panelists uh, to the discussion. The panelists, as you heard, are the presidents of the respective bar associations in the region. And uh, they'll be exchange ideas with us on the state of the rule of law in the region. But what does the rule of law entail? Well, simplistically, it is really the antithesis of arbitrary use of power. So all the rule of law entails that we 
born as humans are, are equal. We may be different in various ways, but in personality we are equal and therefore we must be treated equally before the law. Uh, the rule of law dictates a complete absence of uh, discrimination based on any criteria, whether it is the gender, the community of origin, and so on. So the implications of this are quite uh, enormous, and we could just mention them. Um, the first, of course, is what I've mentioned, is that uh, the systems in our respective states should accord us equal opportunities and equal treatment. And secondly, um, we should have a state of governance or governments uh, which are based on uh, people's consent, uh, which have been brought in power uh, politically with a mandate to act um, in, in the interest of the public, of all of us. Um, <clears throat> they should actually be governing under the law. And these are laws that must be promulgated in a transparent manner by bodies that have been uh, um, accorded mandate through elections, uh, popular elections. So the other implication is respect to human rights. The protection of human rights is essential under conditions of the rule of law. Um, and we, the, the focus should not be on only political and civil rights, but uh, in modern times, uh, this has been extended to all sorts of rights, economic, cultural, and so on. This of course includes the gender rights. And for us in the region, we now have under the uh, East African Community Integration System, a range of new rights um, of the community, uh, which includes uh, free movement of our people throughout the region, free, free movement of services, including professional services, where we are concerned as lawyers, uh, free movement of workers, and free movement of capital. All these should be protected and respected. So this also implies the existence of organs and institutions in support of uh, democracy, uh, which are representative both at national and uh, local levels, at parliament and uh, district or other local government uh, levels. And these should pass laws and also provide oversight over any organ or institutions that exercise power uh, on behalf of, of the people. Moving on, we should have uh, under the rule of law, a system of uh, uh, settling of disputes because uh, when we exercise our rights and freedoms, there are bound to be conflicts of interest and that requires that there is a system that uh, um, is involved in resolving disputes, a justice system which is independent, not under the influence of any uh, person or organ, uh, which has capacity resourced and uh, is respected. 
that is what is required in our respective states and at regional level under the rule of law. We have uh, other institutions in support of democracy and uh, these are also essential for purposes of upholding the rule of law. Uh, we have uh, institutions that are involved in management of uh, elections. That is to enable the people to choose their leaders in a free and fair manner. So we have election management bodies in every state. Um, and these under the rule of law should be constituted in a, a transparent and a competitive manner. They ought to be assisted, resourced, and uh, treated as independent, not simply baptized as independent, but actually conferred independence, which is necessary for their work. In addition to this, it's necessary and uh, most of our states have uh, instituted uh, other institutions in support of uh, justice and, and, and the enhancement of human rights. Uh, examples are the human rights commissions that exist in uh, Uganda, there's also one in Kenya. In addition, there should be institutions in support of uh, public accountability because the rule of law also involves that all players in, in governance and uh, in protection of human rights are accountable uh, to the public. And these are also institutions that should be independent. I'm talking about institutions like the Commission for Administrative Justice of Kenya, or Inspectorate of Government in Uganda, or the Ombudsman of of, uh, of Rwanda and similar institutions in other states. So from what I've stated, it, it is obvious that uh, the rule of law is not about uh, rule by law. It's about rule that is not arbitrary. Uh, it is a, a, a very antithesis of uh, abuse of power. Um, so now in our respective states, of course, we are all enjoined to advise government on the enhancement of the rule of law. Uh, and East African Law Society, where we gather today, is an important institution for purposes of advising on the observance of the rule of law in the region. It's particularly important because first is constituted of the respective bar, bars of the, of the region. And uh, secondly, as the chair of the webinar has stated, human rights are central to the process of integration in which we are involved. Uh, this is reflected in the treaty and in the various protocols and laws of the community. We also have the East African Court of Justice, uh, which is set up to ensure that uh, the rule of law governance under the treaty uh, is observed. East African Law Society has a special observer uh, status at the East African community. And hence, it is incumbent upon us to ensure that we play our proper role in trying to advise both at a national and at regional level. 
and to intervene in a democratic manner where necessary. So today you've been informed that a rule of law committee has been set up and is hoped that the rule of committee will be the channel through which uh, me messages will come out, statements will come out to every player about the necessity for observing the rule of law, uh, through which there will be uh, practical interventions, uh, whether through court action or otherwise. So we, I'm happy that uh, I'm speaking at this webinar, which is one of the, the well, first of uh, the first of uh, the series of activities that East African Law Society will hold uh, in in the area of the rule of law. And I invite uh, our presidents of the respective bar associations to interact with us over the state of the rule of law in the various aspects that have been mentioned. Uh, how are we faring? Do we have democratic governance? Uh, do we have uh, observation of human rights as expected? Are organs and institutions of democracy and accountability function and how to function. All these and other matters are areas for discussion, not only at this webinar, but probably uh, in a series of webinars that will follow. So let's talk candidly uh, in, in the interests of our respective states and particularly in the region uh, which we want to integrate, not only economically, but also politically. It is impossible to integrate where there is no convergence in matters of uh, good governance, in matters of the rule of law. Uh, and when you talk about the possibility of political federation, that will never be achieved unless we reach convergence in respect of good governance and observance of the rule of law. That means that all states must move together and it's the duty of East African society that uh, to, to ensure that uh, this, this progress is made towards convergence that will assist the people of East Africa to integrate and develop uh, economically as well as politically. I thank you very much. Thank you, Prof, for your keynote address. I think as you have rightly stated, our mandate as the East Africa Law Society and one of the reasons for which it was formed was to advance the cause of rule of law within the region. This afternoon, we continue to build on that foundation that was laid by our founding partners. In the face of increased deterioration of rule of law within the region. And therefore, this webinar will have the presidents of the bar associations share their experience and give us a status on the rule of law. We'll also have questions from the attendees to enable interaction between the bar presidents, professor who is the chairman of the East Africa Law Society Rule of Law Committee that we have founded to continue to advance the cause of rule of law. So that our actions and questions will be answered. Prof, as you have rightly stated, it is time to hear from our bar presidents and we shall start our discussion with uh, President Nelson Harvey from the Law Society of Kenya. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you, friends. 
perhaps I, I could start from this point. Uh, the, the Law Society of Kenya is set up as a statutory body with functions which include inter alia to assist the government and the courts in respect to three key functions. These three these key functions are legislation, administration of justice, and the practice of law in Kenya. Often when we address the excesses of government, be it by the legislature, the executive, or the judiciary, the response comes with a question, why is the Law Society of Kenya concerned with politics? Why the Law Society of Kenya concerned with the administration or the manner in which the judiciary is to act? The, the answer is the statute itself. And over and above statute, we derive the mandate to participate in the affairs of the three arms of government from the constitution itself. I will start with legislation where under Article 119 of the Constitution of Kenya, everybody has the right to petition parliament to enact legislation, to amend or repeal legislation. This is a role that the Law Society of Kenya has played for a long period of time in tandem with our mandate under the statute. What about the executive? Often, the level of check insofar as the Law Society of Kenya is concerned relates to Fair Administrative Actions Act, which again is provided for expressly in the Constitution under Article 47, under Fair Administrative Action. And under Fair Administrative Action, four elements are underscored. The action needs to be expeditious, it needs to be efficient, it needs to be lawful, it needs to be reasonable and procedurally fair. What about the judiciary? The judiciary under Article 159 is expressed to exercise authority on behalf of the people. It is also expressed to be independent though accountable. The law society participates to a great extent in ensuring that we have independence and accountability of uh, the judiciary. To what extent do we do this? Under the Judicial Service Commission, the constitution guarantees two slots where representatives of the Law Society of Kenya participate in the recruitment of judges, magistrates, and judicial staff, as well as disciplining and considering petitions for their removal. My, 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 my understanding of, of this uh, symbiotic relationship between government and the law society is that we play a fundamental role ensuring that there is the rule of law by those who have been given power by the people to govern within the framework of the three arms of government that we have. How have we fared on and in particular, I will put emphasis on the constitution, which was promulgated on the 27th of August, 2010. There has been considerable progress in ensuring that there is rule of law and constitutionalism in Kenya. But the question will be, have we fared on excellently? Is the scorecard one which that we are pleased with we can look at the legislature, for instance. There have been instances in the last few years where laws have been passed that do not conform with the constitution, do not encompass public participation by the people, and are outrightly unlawful. Some of these laws have been successfully challenged in court with the Law Society of Kenya playing a very active role. We can mention uh, the last event in which the Law Society of Kenya has participated in ensuring that there is the rule of law insofar as the legislature is concerned. This culminated in the advisory that was given by the Chief Justice of the Republic of Kenya 
last year advising the president to dissolve parliament for failure to enact legislation towards implementation of the two-third gender rule. This action has not been received very well. There's been a lot of resistance from both the legislature and the executive, an indicator that to a large extent those in power consider the constitution and the law as an inconvenience as opposed to a tool that is intended to enable them govern effectively for the benefit of the people. There are many other examples, but let me limit them. Let me now handle the executive. During the first four years of the promulgation of the constitution, there was considerable compliance with the constitution insofar as administrative decisions were made by the executive. But commencing the year 2016 up to now, we have received so many cases of excesses of executive orders and administrative decisions that are outrightly in contravention and violation of the constitution. Some of these administrative decisions have been successfully challenged in court. But even where we succeed in court, the decisions we get in court end up being paper decisions because they are not respected to a large extent by the executive. And if you look at it from that point of view, you realize that the scorecard insofar as the administration of justice is concerned, a function that the law society is empowered by statute to assist the government is not a good scorecard. I believe there is more that can be done by the legal fraternity in Kenya and also the legal fraternity in the region to ensure that the mandate that we've been given under statute and the constitution and ensuring that there is fair administrative action is achieved. And lastly, let me look at the judiciary. The judiciary out of the three arms of government has been the biggest casualty of excesses by the executive or failure of proper oversight by the legislature. In Kenya, as we speak right now, we have 40 judges, though recommended for appointment by the Judicial Service Commission, have remained in judicial purgatory for a period of over one year. As a result, access to justice has been impaired, but over and above the impairment of the access to justice, there is the critical element of the independence of the judiciary. We prevail in a situation whereby, whereas the executive does not have an active role, save for supervising the swearing in upon appointment of judges, the executive has persisted in its failure to enable the swearing in of judges. At this particular moment, we are handling the recruitment of the chief justice to succeed Chief Justice David Maraga. And it's a matter of public notoriety that the tenure of Chief Justice David Maraga is indicated to be one in which the rule of law and constitutionalism prevailed in the courts of justice. Many decisions were made to uphold the constitution and to ensure that government functions within the balances and checks set out in the constitution. It is our expectation that the Judicial Service Commission will not be impaired in the choice of the Chief Justice and that the Chief Justice who will succeed retired Chief Justice David Maraga will be as good if not better as the retired Chief Justice. Again, this is an area where the legal fraternity in Kenya will have to play a fundamental role first through our two representatives to the Judicial Service Commission and secondly as an overall oversight within the ambit of the objectives and functions given to us under statute. 
But I think I can proudly say of all the countries within the region, perhaps there is greater democratic space in Kenya. The Bill of Rights has to a considerable extent been, uh, been, been, been followed by the government and where there is a violation, the courts of law have not been hesitant to ameliorate any plight of individuals or institutions whose rights and fundamental freedoms have been infringed. And it's for that reason that uh, I have over the last few months looked for support from uh, our colleagues within the region to ensure that if at all the space we enjoy in Kenya can be expanded to all the countries within the region in order that what we do as advocates counts to a large extent insofar as laws are concerned so that the legislature is able to make laws that conform with the constitution and do not violate the rights of the citizens. So that the executive in its implementation of the laws made by the legislature acts within the confine of the constitution and where those powers are restrained or limited, especially through a court order, there is compliance. But above all, it is very important that in the region, we have judiciaries that are independent and accountable. And nobody is better placed to ensure that accountability and independence than the respective bars of the countries within the East African region. In conclusion, I would like to say that much as the scorecard insofar as the rule of law is concerned in East Africa is not so good to write home about, I don't think we need to despair. There is hope if all of us work together to ensure that constitutionalism and rule of law prevails now and throughout the time that the rule of law is supposed to govern a constitutional democracy in Kenya, in Burundi, Rwanda, Uganda, Tanganyika, Zanzibar, and Southern Sudan. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, President Harvey, for that. Uh, as you've heard him say, all hope is not lost for East Africa. We can all still work together. We can all work together to realize this, to realize, achieve, um, ensure the rule of law is adhered to. Uh, our next speaker is President Fiona Wall from Uganda. President Wall, you've had President Harvey speak on how the Law Society of Kenya has filed a number of petitions in the courts to ensure that the rule of law is being adhered to. Maybe at this point, you could take us through what is happening in Uganda. Thank you very much. Um, has done, what has ULS done to ensure that the rule of law is being adhered to? Welcome, President. Thank you very much, um, uh, Chair. Um, and thank you, everybody, listeners, um, President, East African Law Society, the presidents of the East African countries, the chairman of the Rule of Law Committee of the East African Law Society, and Madame Barbara Maloa, our, our chair of the panel. I just wanted to <clears throat> um, continue from where President Harvey has left off. Our African nations are very similar. Um, the Uganda Law Society is established by statute and just like the Kenya Law Society. And we are mandated to be an advisor to government on issues of law and good governance uh, and the public, uh, to advise the public as well. 
We also are champions uh, and watchdogs on the rule of law and the respect of the same. We also are mandated with increasing access to justice for the indigent. Um, we also lastly are mandated with ensuring the professional development of our members. And this is one of uh, this, this, this particular um, webinar, I think will contribute to that as well. Uganda, I will, because I have a few minutes, I will restrict myself to the past, um, ju just the past half year, uh, because it has been, it has touched on so many aspects of the rule of law in our country. And uh, I'll talk about, uh, of course, the rule of law, when we look at the rule of law, we're talking about uh, is there true separation of powers? Is there fairness in application of the law? Is there accountability to the law of uh, especially our, our different organs, our officials, the state and the public? Is there equity or equality before the law in the way people are treated, access to justice, access to services? And then whether there's respect for human rights, um, especially where the law is being applied. And lastly, uh, transparency. When we think about especially socioeconomic rights and, and all the other rights. Um, Uganda's situation was not helped by COVID, but I think Uganda, the government sort of <clears throat> rose to the occasion quite well and uh, tried to legislate as it went along. Um, the Ministry of Health also did quite well. And I think up to now, we still have some of the lowest cases on the continent. Um, one of the things that uh, came out in COVID though, was that these COVID regulations came up and the COVID regulations uh, created a state uh, that was quite peculiar because we're not in a state of emergency. Uh, and, and, and what happened is that now the, the people, the people are caught in a net of following these regulations. Um, the prisons were overpopulated, but at the same time, we had an overzealous security force that um, embarked on arresting people in mass. And this caused a lot of human rights violations with, um, first of all, the prisons being congested, the courts were closed at the time, uh, so people could not even be remanded or presented in court. The 48-hour rule was heavily violated during that time. And as we came out of the lockdown, we, we saw um, a determination on the part of government to ensure that elections take place, despite uh, the fact that uh, we were being told otherwise. Now, the issue of having elections, COVID-19 and the state of rule of law in Uganda has been also very peculiar. Um, it started off, I think, with for the law society, the peculiar issue was the arrest of human rights defenders and lawyers, um, especially in the course of their duty. And, and this, of course, was dealt with uh, very reliably in a case um, of Shaban Gutu versus Uganda. And, and we're very happy to see uh, the judge actually rule that no lawyer should be, should be persecuted or prosecuted in the course of his duty. Um, and this presented a very good uh, precedent for that. We also have seen a lot of election violence on the 18th and 19th of, on, on, of November. We saw a peculiarity with uh, Ugandan citizens going out and uh, promulgating violence and then the state coming out and uses, using excessive force, which resulted in the death of more than 40 people. Uh, this was very unfortunate, um, but it was also an indictment on all that were involved, not just the state agencies, but also the individuals that were unwilling to resolve their, their disputes uh, in a legal way, showing also a further distrust of the, of the system uh, this has this this culminated again into what has now come out as kidnaps. We've had people disappearing. We've seen 
uh, the election violence that came out, that usually you know comes into these elections, and we have also seen um, an unwillingness of the state sometimes to be transparent about what is happening. So, what has the rule of has the Uganda Law Society been doing in this season? Um, first of all, we have we have engaged in dialogue. We released uh, two rule of law reports that uh, reported on the state of rule of law. We also presented these reports to the observers, sorry, to the state, state players, the executive, the legislature and the judiciary because they spoke on all the things that were happening there. Um, we also communicated with the judiciary and stressed the importance of bail because some of our judicial officers take bail to be uh, something that should only be given, be given as an exception, and this has caused a lot of problems. Um, we have also been engaged in using the courts as well. And uh, I think you have seen us appear in defense of some of our human rights uh, defenders like uh, Nicolas Opio. We also have, we in preparation for the election petition environment that we're in right now, we came up with an election uh, petition compendium um, that covered a period that we believe um, say, spoke a lot to the constitutionalism and the issues of rule of law in elections uh, between 2000 and 2011. So this compendium was released in December and launched and also distributed to the stakeholders to ensure that um, we learned from our mistakes. And uh, we also learned from the jurisprudence of the time. We have also participated as election observers and our report is coming out. But uh, the Uganda Law Society was also very awake to the fact that this is an environment where people needed uh, a voice, people needed defense and people needed a rapid response. So we created a rapid response task force of 100 advocates countrywide and uh, I'm glad to say that we've been able to resolve uh, over 100 disputes, uh, not disputes, uh, 100 issues already. We have about um, seven cases of disappearances that we're currently dealing with, but we've also been able to get involved in some of the, um, the disputes that the state had with some of the political players and, and try to, 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 to broker peace. We have, um, we have petitioned parliament on various, uh, various legislations. As Harvey said, sometimes the parliament might not be that willing to play their role. And uh, we have three legislations that we've been championing with all our resources. We have the legal aid bill. Um, and the legal aid bill is really to ensure that everybody in the country gets legal aid that needs it. And this legal aid bill has been a thorn in our flesh because the state does not want to take responsibility for it. Legal aid in the country uh, is, Uga uh, Uganda Law Society runs the largest legal aid project in Uganda with about 23 towns. And we've been able to do about 65,000 people in the last 25 years. However, when you look at the numbers of how many people actually need access to justice. When you look at the problems we have, refugees, we have the, we are the largest refugee receptacle in the region. We have justice issues that come from SGBB. Just the last three months have created enough justice issues to keep us busy for the next two years. So because of these issues, um, we want the legal aid bill passed, uh, but the government does not want it to have an, a, a, a financial implication on, on the budget, which is, um, which is very unfortunate. So one of the things that we've been doing is petitioning. We petition the speaker to ensure that this passes through. We also have the human rights defenders uh, bill, which we think is going to go a long way in protecting human rights. Uh, human rights defenders because currently they're not recognized and a lot of them, especially the journalists, you've seen uh, the Uganda Communications Commission increase uh, on, the, on the aggressive uh, regula reg regulation, aggressive regulation that is actually creating such as, as, as 
a stiff environment for the for the media and and the media players so we need the human rights defenders bill to pass so that situations like what happened with Nicolas Opio do not happen we have also seen the sexual offenses bill uh, that we've been um, agitating for and asking parliament again to pass our fight with SGBV and sexual harassment has been a long one, and we've seen a lot of it happening in schools, and it's gone unchecked for a long time because we do not have a register of sexual offenders. So the Ministry of Education transfers problems sometimes without even knowing. So we have uh, this sexual offenders bill, which is going to probably be the first legislation that recognizes that the victims of sexual offenses are not only women, um, and that will also say a lot uh, to the way that sexual offenses are tried, the sensitivity, because we've had a lot of problems with uh, judicial officers and, and prosecutors and how they treat the victims of sexual offenses and even the defense lawyers. So we believe that this will change a lot in that aspect. And these are the three bills that we've been agitating for and advocating for in parliament. We also have been looking at um, the governance environment and we have appealed to the president and to the state on the fact that the inspectorate of government does not currently have a head, uh, neither the human rights, does the human rights commission have a chairperson. And now these are two very important um, and also constitutionally established organizations that, that are actually watchmen, uh, watchdogs or official watchdogs on the rule of law, on good governance and in institutions. Without a head, these, uh, these, these, these organ organs are not very effective. And even the Human Rights Commission itself right now cannot hold any hearings because of the way the tribunal is required to have the chair of the commission. So this has caused many problems, has increased the backlog, has of course, you know, justice delayed is justice denied and has promulgated, the, has increased the aspect of human rights uh, injustices that, we are, that, that our people are facing. Um, we also need to, there, there, there are two things that also came out during the elections, the unwillingness sometimes of the political players to follow the regulations and their treatment and sometimes the careless remarks they made about the COVID-19 regulations, I think increased the spread. And in December, we saw uh, almost an almost vertical spike in the increase of um, the COVID-19 um, infections in Uganda in particular. And I believe that uh, this has brought to light the need for political players, for leaders in Uganda to, to behave responsibly and, and, and put the interests of Ugandans and the livelihoods of Ugandans at the forefront, even when running for office. Um, right now, as the Uganda Law Society, we're looking into two major issues. During this period, we've also seen um, the gross abuse of the Bugoma forest. Uh, so the environment has also suffered during this time, and this is something we're looking into and we're going to go into uh, legislatively. Uh, last year, we were very happy to have the Judiciary Administration Bill passed. So for the first time, the issue of balance of power might actually become a reality uh, with the judiciary finally getting some, some room to breathe. Uh, especially financially. Uh, we also saw the passing of the Human Rights Enforcement Act, um, which act we are basing on to do some, um, some enforcement of certain rights and also prosecution of some officers that have uh, been identified to have been involved in illegal activities, especially torture. We've also seen, as the Uganda Law Society, we have engaged in dialogue, we have released statements, and we've put into public the issue of the use of undegazetted uh, detention centers, the, the issue of people disappearing and the kidnaps, the issue of torture. And these issues, I think, have become top of mind, especially in our engagement with the state 
state players. So as we speak, we are actually preparing um, some, some action. We had an EGM and our members resolved on some issues that we're handling. And I'm also very glad to report that uh, currently something that our legislators let us down in was pass an act on professionals, uh, adding 100,000 shilling tax to our practice, to every practicing certificate of every prof professional, which not only discourages practice, but also causes issues with uh, we're trying to encourage professionalism, but now taxing people in a, in a place of COVID, in the time of COVID, is like it's like just killing the profession. So we are in court right now. We're in the constitutional court. We've put up a petition against that. Uh, we also went to the court over the Trade License Act, which was um, again double regulation for lawyers, and we we were successful. And then the other professionals asked us to represent them, so we're also doing that. We have put a petition also in parliament, in sorry, in court. And uh, these are some of the things that Uganda is doing, and this is the environment within which we are um, operating. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, President Fiona. Uh, it's very encouraging to hear that you've actually been in office for quite a short time, but you've already managed to achieve so much. Uh, I'm also happy to hear about the Human Rights Defenders Bill. I must say, I believe a number of us within the region are following what, hap what was happening to Council Nicholas, and it was very important. Uh, so this, the Human Rights Defenders Bill is highly welcomed. Uh, before I move to the next speaker, just a few comments from our participants. Uh, President Harvey, always erudite, eclectic and superb, a great orator uh, from Donald. Very glad to learn about the ULS rapid response team and the work that it has done. Uh, members, continue sending in your your comments and also questions. We'll pick, we'll have a Q and A session after all the speakers have addressed us. Uh, allow me to move to our next speaker for the afternoon. This is Prince Julian Batonia Julian Kavarunga from Rwanda. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Uh, President Hillen, just speaking from what President Harvey has, speaking from what President Harvey said, and also President Fiona, one of the things they stated is that parliament in the respective countries is not really willing to play their role. Is that the same position in Rwanda, or do you have a different experience? Welcome, President Hillen. Thank you, Barbara. So, uh, I will be following what the other members has been saying, is that they are doing a little bit better, but they can do more. What we say about the parliament is that many laws are being enacted by mem members of parliament and challenged by the society, bar association, civil society afterwards. So there may be, we are requesting as a bar association, a better communication from our MPs, parliament, to know in advance what they are discussing to engage a little bit more with uh, those associations and people being potentially impacted by the laws that they are uh, implement, that they are discussing and impacting. So they are members of the society, but sometimes we have a better understanding of what they are doing. When the law is enacted, we are the lawyers that will be protecting those rights. We are the lawyers that will be fighting for people, citizens. They are also uh, that have been electing them. So in Rwanda, we are fighting as a bar association to be much more involved in what is being produced. And the certain element is that uh, it's the same within the region and even worldwide that government tends to have more power, more resources and more people to, to work on legislation, to work on uh, issues of the society and uh, Parliament and the judiciary have issues usually of uh, time and means like for the judiciary, we have been always fighting that uh, when a judge to be independent, he needs resources, he needs offices, he needs uh, uh, to be able to issue decision on online court. He needs to be comfortable having electricity in, in his office, having 
access to that internet at home and uh, at his office. So it will allow a clear uh, separation of powers and uh, a clear uh, rule of law within the decision that we are expecting from, from the judiciary. So those are the, the, the issues uh, I could mention for equality before the law, that is one of the principles of uh, justice. It means also what uh, Fiona was saying that there is a legal aid fund that is needed. If you have means, you will be have, having access to a good lawyer, you will be having uh, many lawyers that can discuss your case, have access to the jurisprudence, have time to read it, discuss and go before the judge with uh, a written statement that allow a judge to give uh, a decision that is well uh, analyzed with the means that you've been putting in with your legal team. Legal aid funds will allow the Bar Association in the region to have access to those funds and uh, be able to provide pro bono services to many people. We see what we are doing with minors where with the little we get from the, the current uh, legal aid that is provided by the Ministry of Justice, allowing that there is a protection with minors that are uh, having issues with criminal matters within Rwanda and protecting GBV, fighting GBV, uh, gender-based violence uh, victims. It's two things we have been beginning uh, last year and that is giving good results. And we see what we could be doing if the budget was slightly enhanced, but it's always an issue of budget and wherever there is a cut in budget, we tend to see that is uh, the judiciary and the Ministry of Justice is being uh, one of the, they are usually affected much more than other ministry. Even with COVID, we see that many government will be struggling with their budget. They need to make some uh, reduction on expenses before, because they have been having special expenses to fight COVID. But that is the reason to always consider justice sector as an essential services, consider advocate, consider uh, the judiciary as element part of uh, uh, a government uh, following the rule of law. So in Rwanda, we have been having a government that has been putting measures, anti-COVID measures to protect citizens and they have been doing well. So we are happy on that sense but the element of communication that was going with it was creating, uh, uh, especially in the League of Fraternity, a surprise. So willing to know, can we have those measures that are needed, that everybody knows that uh, it has to be implemented, but if they could give one or two days before of timing for being uh, having the time to prepare, having the time to know that we have some right, having the time to challenge if needed, or to give advice, that is something that usually government is uh, willing to, to move forward to fight COVID, which is necessary for the right, they have the obligation to protect citizens, the right of life. And at the same time, there is a kind of accountability to the law, that the law that is being put in place, it's a case of force majeure that everybody is uh, thinking that is right, it has to be done, but there is also a right of fairness in the application of the law making sure that everybody has been having the same opportunity to react to the new measures that are being put in place. So uh, making sure that there is a separation of power, that is fine in Rwanda because the judiciary tends to be independent, but they need more means for us. So we are just advocate, what is special, we advocate for enhancing salaries of uh, judges. If somebody has to decide that you may be in jail for 10 years, and uh, he, he decided with a small salary, uh, when you're fighting corruption, you need those people to be comfortable. You need them to be experienced and independent. So it's sometimes difficult if they have issues uh, with their salary to remain independent or to remain uh, comfortable and uh, focus on the decision they have to issue. So that the other element the Bar Association in Rwanda is fighting for is participating in the decision-making. That was your question, Barbara, for engaging with members of the parliament, engaging with the Law Reform Commission, engaging with the Ministry of Justice, discussing with the prosecutor, national prosecutor uh, office and uh, arresting somebody is uh, an exception. 
it's always we tend being on the defense side, we tend to think that there is other option before arresting somebody. But in our region, I've been hearing that in Uganda, in other jurisdictions, it's also happening. In Rwanda, there has been some effort with the Rwanda Investigation Bureau that was following the pro police and the criminal investigation uh, department that was there before, but they need more trainings of their officers for respecting advocates when they come and again, when exercising their duty. And there is also an issue of training that is needed and awareness of the rights of uh, somebody on uh, being arrested or being investigated. So those are the, uh, the point we, we have been having and discussing with our authorities. And when fighting corruption, because in Rwanda, we, we, we have a policy of zero tolerance on corruption, but it can have some negative impact when as soon as somebody is being uh, investigated for corruption, you may have officers stopping his bank account, stopping uh, a transaction, financial transaction that was ongoing. Uh, and having an impact on his access to justice because he has to pay a lawyer, he has to pay some uh, school fees for the kids, he has to pay his staff, uh, and uh, those negative impact with a good, a good legislation being in place, fighting corruption, but uh, also making sure that there is no negative impact because of the implementation of that good law. So we, that's a, a key thing that remaining sure that somebody being arrested is is done because there is no other option. There is an uh, alternative solution being uh, uh, planned to be implemented, like allowing him to have uh, a system, an electronic system, allowing somebody to remain at home to move within a certain area, but not being arrested, but being under monitoring of the Rwanda Investigation Bureau or the prosecutor office. So there is also a solution. We think that uh, it's needed. It's working together like we are doing with Bar Association in this forum under the umbrella of the ELS. And I salute uh, the President Bernard for this initiative and his team. And I salute the committee of Professor Sempebwa because uh, that will be a forum where our members in each jurisdiction will be able to discuss rule of law issues, solution that has been provided. If it is solution available in Uganda and Kenya, will be uh, also available for Rwandan. If there is something that we have been uh, experiencing that is positive in Rwanda, we can exchange it with our members in ELS uh, through the uh, rule of law committee on the level of ELS and to make sure that in each jurisdiction we have that rule of law committee that can uh, uh, transfer cases or trans transfer issues or questions when they need to rise to, to our fellow representative in the rule of law committee on the level of ELS. We need more training on the rule of law because people tend to understand just rule of law without knowing what is covered, what, what, what kind of principles are covered by the rule of law. And the advocate needs to understand the right to be able to fight for, uh, for what is needed. And uh, uh, if there is an issue, raise the issue on the level of the law society or the bar association for more advocacy when we are together, we can fight together, we can uh, communicate easily, we can open knock on the door of the Minister of Justice, of the Attorney General, of the Prosecutor General, or the Secretary General of the Rwanda Investigation Bureau. We can fight together as uh, a forum, ELS is, being, is there for protecting its members. If one of us is being affected and all of us, we fight together to, to challenge any issue arising, I think we are stronger together. So rule of law with advocate, uh, I don't know now how many we are in ELS. I think nothing we want, if we are really sure that we want that to happen in, for, for protecting the rule of law, as it is uh, a main objective of our existence, we will be fighting for that. So getting information, sharing information and experience, fighting together, finding solution together, it's what I can think conclude on this and I'm ready to answer some questions that may arise. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Julian. Allow me to jump straight to the president of the Tanganyika Law Society, 
Dr. Ruge Meleza, please tell us about the state of the rule of law in Tanzania and as a country. Are you on the right path? Okay, good afternoon. Thank you, Barbara and the, the East African Society President and all countries, presidents of, the, of our respective bar associations. Uh, I think uh, when it, this kind of an endeavor is, is timely in the sense that our region is passing through very, very difficult times. The belief into the rule of law is somewhat uh, diminished within the establishment cycles, most of, most of whom think that uh, once you're in power, you can do anything. And the, your people are supposed to toe the line. But the whole essence of a civilized society is the rule of law, which means all people are, are, are under the law and the, they are supposed to enjoy their freedoms under the law then each and every person is equal before the law. The government is accountable to, the, to, to its people, as they are to the democratic values espoused by civilized nation. And the government is more than willing to enforce the judgments rendered by the courts. For that matter, our courts are also supposed to be independent. They're supposed to, and also the parliament are supposed to, our parliaments are supposed to pass laws which are constitutional and also they, they advance the, the realization of, of human rights. This was more said in, the, in our Tanzanian case in the, in, the early, in, the, in the early 90s, the case of Chumchua, son of Marwa versus the officer in charge of Musoma prisons, where Justice Morosanya, I think, captured it very well when he said in the following words, I believe that the rule of law means more than acting in accordance with the law. The rule of law must mean fairness of the government. Rule of law should extend to the examination of the contents of the law, of the laws to see whether the, the, let, the, the, the latter conforms to the, the latter conforms to the ideal and that the law does not give the government too much power. The rule of law is opposed to the rule of arbitrary power. The rule, the rule of law requires that the government should be subject to the law, not that the law be subject to the government. If the law is wide enough to justify a dictatorship, then there is no rule of law. Therefore, if the rule of law, all, all it means that the government will operate in accordance with the law, the doctrine of the rule of law becomes a betrayal of the individual. If the laws themselves are not fair, but oppressive and degrading, the courts have to bridge the yawning gap between the letter of the law and the reality in, in the field of the rule of law. So th th we thought we had uh, created a good uh, uh, principle in Tanzania when, it, when, when our, 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 the, our, the High Court so proclaimed in that famous case of Chumchua Maru. But what has been happening lately, uh, perhaps uh, I think it shows, shows, shows that most of the gains we made in, in, the, in, the, in the 90s have somewhat been eroded. Uh, we see that some the draconian laws are being passed or some laws which are basically whittling away the, 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 the rights of, of individuals are passed with, with impunity. For example, last year, uh, all of you must have read the case of uh, Christopher Mtikira, which is a famous case about, which was decided by the late Justice Ruga Kingira. And he talked about uh, the issue of public interest litigation being a cornerstone of uh, of democracy and ensuring that the rule of law is adhered by, by all. And he said, the rule of law, the, the Article 26, sub Article 1, and sub Article 2 of our Constitution, uh, they, they grant each and every person a right to ensure that there is a rule of law in our country, there's constitutionality, and at the same time, even if one is not directly injured, he or she can file a public interest case. What happened last year, after so many cases have, have been filed, most of whom were, were, were in the recent past have not been successful, but uh, the, the few that sneaked in or are able to be sustained by, by, by the high court, those eked some people in the government, then you now the Best Criteria Duties Enforcement Act was amended last year by this the written laws, Miscellaneous Amendment Act number three of 2020, which basically now say uh, uh, curtailed 
the, the, the standing to, to individuals to file public interest litigation. While Article 26 of Article 1 grants you a standing to file a case, even though you're not directly injured, now uh, 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 the, the, the written laws, Miscellaneous Amendment, Amendment Act number no. 3 of 20, 2020 says you must demonstrate the personal injury. So you cannot file directly a public interest case in Tanzania, which is contrary to the Constitution. Just looking at it, a statute cannot uh, uh, abridge the, 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 the right, uh, uh, the constitutional right. The standing is given directly by the Constitution. Now you, you see, uh, you have people. The government goes uh, went forward and basically requires that now you must be directly injured. Uh, if you can also a personal, if you can also show the, uh, a personal injury, then basically you don't have standing. And uh, for us, we find this quite, quite, uh, uh, it's, it's quite sad. You, 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 know, you don't expect this this time, the year of the age, for for such kind of registration being uh, be, being passed. Then. Uh, the issue about freedom of association, NGOs or civil society organizations are, are critical in ensuring that we, we have an accountable government. But, uh, and the NGOs are able to raise funds from many sources, domestic and foreign. But uh, in 2018, the government went ahead and passed a, a, a regulation which requires that all NGOs that obtain funding from abroad, they must submit those uh, grant awards to the, to the registrar of NGOs and the, for, for approval. So you might have a, a grant already given or grant given to you by, by a donor, but and, and, and if it's more than 20 million Tanzanian shillings, then he, if you don't have the approval of the registrar of NGOs, you can't operate. So it means the, the NGOs are at the mercy of, of the government. And for that matter, you, you, you take it there, they say it's not in, in our interest. Uh, and you, you go, another thing, even our, uh, the, the constitutions of NGOs are supposed to be somewhat similar. There is a framework or a draft, a draft constitution, which you basically just go and fill some minor details about the name of your organization, the location where, where that, that NGO is supposed to be located. And your objectives cannot, cannot exceed four, four objectives. And you, are, you, you can only exist, you can be in existence for 10 years. And after 10 years, you must go and basically your certificate must be renewed. So it's up to the, 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 the registrar of NGOs to agree to renew your certificate, to extend you, to give you another, another lease of life, or just to kick you out and say, perhaps we don't need you anymore. Then in, uh, last year we had our general election. An election is a franchise in which citizens are able to elect their, their, their leaders. And it's, it's an opportunity for them to say, this person is supposed to be my leader, or that one is not supposed to be. And for that matter, you expect this to be the most uh, uh, guarded, the most efficiently run uh, uh, undertaking. But uh, now, what has happened, you have a national, uh, a national election commission, uh, commission which basically is given the power, and uh, is given the power even to monitor the kind of people who are supposed to conduct civic education for, 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 to conscientize people on their, on, their, on their rights, their election rights and so many other things. Then even the people who are supposed to monitor the elections even do so many other things. If you are not approved by the National Election Commission, you cannot, under, you cannot involve yourself in the election monitoring, civic education and so many other things. And basically, this, this is an affront to uh, to 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 to, uh, to the, the, the rule of law and ensuring that uh, our we, we have we have a democracy. Uh, as a citizens, we are supposed to ensure that uh, our, our elections are free and fair. Uh, if they are free and fair, how can we ensure that they are free and fair? Our uh, the, the, the election bodies are supposed to be independent. But of course, we have an, an election commission which is uh, is nominated by the president, and. Uh, 
the, the, the commissioners can be hired and or can be fired at any time by the president, who most of the time you might find is, is also a candidate. And you expect him or her to be there, uh, to be an, a, 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 an independent arbiter. This is ask, a, a, asking too much. Eh? And so for that, for, for that matter, you, you find that uh, our, uh, what happened last year is something laughable, to say the least. And you are told you had an election, but basically your conscience does not tell you you had a free and fair election. And basically it's out of what we have in, in, in our laws. And that's where some people basically, the, the political parties, in, in a strange way, most of the time after elections, you have a lot of election petitions being filed in court. That was not the case last year. While the courts and the law lawyers were trained, they received a lot of CLE tra trainings on, on election laws and so many other things. I think only four cases were filed last year. I think two for, for, two, two for against the members of parliament, uh, for then uh, uh, two, I think, for, for those who people, uh, for the councillor, councillor's uh, elections. So basically, people say it doesn't matter. The outcome is already determined. So why should I waste my time and go, go to court? So I'll, 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 I've talked about uh, cases, uh, uh, many people being arrested and being charged with, so, with, with cases, with money laundering cases. And the money laundering is not available in Tanzania. And once you are charged with money laundering, you are in for it. And some lawyers, have been forced, some lawyers have been caught up because of the way the, our money laundering law is, is structured. Basically, most of the, the advocates here are potential, potential accused, accused persons. And uh, for that matter, uh, it's very, uh, you are basically a cow. You have to submit, uh, submit yourself to the, to the, to the dictates of, 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 of the government and, uh, and, and the other people. So eventually, Many cases are, that are still pending in courts, so criminal cases, you find people are being forced to, to sign pre-bargaining, to enter pre-bargaining agreements, basically, pre to do that they're guilty so that they can, they can reclaim back their, their freedoms. And the other cases, the cases will go on for four, five, five, six years, and you are being told each and every day that uh, in investigations are, are, are still undergoing, and for that matter, people stay in police custody. Uh, uh, the law society has been complaining uh, has been complaining for many years last year even in my election uh, in my law day speech I, I, I said the same thing even this year I, I repeated the same kind of of complaint so we are there and then in terms of, of our laws in terms of uh, somehow we are being emasculated in the sense that uh, the our member our membership will subscription fees that we pay uh, so our our uh, practicing certificate renewal renewals fees that we, we pay annually. I suppose eventually it will come from the, the judiciary and be directed to the law society or to, to TLS. And this law was passed way back in 1961. But to this day, the government has never remitted a single cent to Tanganyika Law Society. And with our increasing number of more than uh, 10,000 lawyers, we expect that, we think we are estimating that over 1 billion Tanzanian shillings every year are being pocketed by the central government, the money which was supposed to be directed to uh, Tanganyika Law Society. So I'll say the rule of law is something that all of us have to, have to fight for. If you don't have a rule of law, it means that we have a, 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 the, the law of the jungle. And the, some people who are in power like that. That's what they, they, they will enjoy. But the rest of us who are out of it, we don't want it. Because we believe that, yes, it's not a, being, for you being muscular, that you should be able to dictate or be, being born in a certain family, uh, people of certain stock. Uh, are, are seen to be more superior than others. But in a democracy, in a country that adheres to the rule of law, all of us are equal before the law. But we must ensure that we create strong and well-functioning independent institutions that understand their, their duties and they are able to discharge their duties. You see, there have been a lot of setbacks in a number, in a number of years in, in, in our countries, but we as lawyers, I think it's incumbent upon us to rise to the occasion and keep forging on. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Anshala. I must say that that was quite a refreshing uh, presentation. Um, 
allow me to invite the next speaker, who is also the president of East African Law Society, uh, President Bernard, who will also take us through the second session, which is the Q and A session, just after he makes his remarks. Karibu sana, President. Asante sana, Barbara. Asante. Let me also thank the presidents for the status they have given us in their respective countries on the rule of law. I think um, we need to do more uh, from what from what I hear. I think Dr. Shala's uh, presentation on money laundering and the fact that uh, now increasingly we see such offenses being used to curtail the civil society or those who are perceived to be fighting for human rights. And the sense in which it comes in is that um, even when you are arrested, they'll say, we are still following the law because the law says money laundering should not be, uh, is, not, is not a bailable offense. So increasingly, even the repression takes the form of, of laws. And therefore, the East Africa Law Society Rule of Law Committee will take some interest into some of these matters and see if we can file against unjust laws um, so that we can have some sort of uh, judgments arising out of the East African Court of Justice. Before we go into the questions, I think I need to highlight something very important. Um, since the presidents have talked about, have spoken about the respective um, countries and their status updates, there's uh, a very big problem currently with the East African Court of Justice that actually the East African Court of Justice has no quorum to conduct transactions. Uh, the council is meeting, the summit is meeting, I think, at the end of this month. And one of the things we are going to highlight uh, is, is to urge them actually to urgently appoint the judges. The first instance division has only three out of five judges. There is no principal judge and there is no deputy principal judge. Um, the, the, the principal judge is supposed to come from Tanzania and the deputy principal judge is supposed to come from Burundi. Of course, the, the rotational principle applies and uh, we are looking towards to Tanzania and Burundi to uh, nominate these judges so that we can have uh, matters that have been filed, handled at the East African Court of Justice. This is a very big concern to us and uh, it is something that we are going to be advocating for and pushing for as we go towards the summit. The appellant court has two out of five judges and there's neither a president or a vice president. And under the principle of rotation, the next president is supposed to come from Burundi and the vice president will come from Uganda. So as you can see urgently, we need to focus on, on, on advocating for the appointment of these judges. So as the East Africa Law Society, we are going to take this up also very seriously and are going to urge the summit to prioritize uh, the appointment of judges. Otherwise, we will not have any matters listened to. So it is something that is going to be very critical. I think the other point that I want to make is, is, is what we have seen in Freement of Rights of the Fourth Estate. I think we have increasingly seen that. And um, there have been some matters which have been filed, for example, in Uganda. Um, it is important that... Um, all stakeholders who are advocating for the rule of law, we as the national bars should be able to continue to protect, to protect um, their rights. And this is something critical that we increasingly see within the region. Um, and, and, and as East Africa Law Society, we are also going to take up some of these matters on the advice of the rule of law uh, committee. So I want to thank the panelists for sharing their thoughts. I think in order to allow the attendees, the people participating, we're going to go into a question and answer session so that we can also hear from you. And after that, we shall have some remarks from, uh, from the guest speaker and, and the bar presidents. So if you have a question, please raise your hand, raise your hand, and then we shall be able to, to, to choose you so that you can be able to ask your questions. Some of the questions have already been answered. Um, if you go into the Q and A session, let me ask Dr. Felix Ciprono. Please ask your question. Dr. 
Dr. Felix. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And thank you very much also the President of the Law Society of Kenya, Mr. Nelson Harvey. Having seen the diagnosis, it's clear that all East African countries they are degenerating in the rule of law. And as such, I think the, the question that begs our attention is, how far and how are the members of the Law Society of Kenya taking up the mantle in order to ensure that the rule of law prevails? Thank you, Dr. Felix, for that question. I'll ask President Nelson Harvey to just answer that one as we get more questions. Thank you, Dr. Felix Kiprono. Your question is how far are members of the Law Society of Kenya taking up the mantle to ensure that the rule of law and constitutionalism is upheld? A main question indeed. Remember, one of the three key point agenda upon which I ran was to uphold the rule of law and constitutionalism. So far, so good. As we near the first anniversary of our term in office, we have done considerably well. And uh, if there is any doubt as to how well we've done, I think the retaliation from the state is indicative of how well we've done. At no one point in time in the history of the Law Society, save for the time in the 90s when Dr. Gibson Kamau Kuria and Paul Mwite were the forefront for the restoration of multi-party democracy, have we experienced retaliation from the state insofar as the Law Society is, is concerned. But I'm happy to, 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 to inform but notwithstanding the resistance that we experience, at least we have the courts of law that are a bastion of hope in ensuring that our endeavor to sustain the stain, the stain of law is not lost. But Mwalimu, whilst we are at it, I want to encourage you and all our members to realize the need as to why a law society that is impactful is important for sustaining the fabric of the rule of law and constitutionalism. And this fact will never be lost because there is a continued effort to undermine what we do. And as the leadership of the law society, we can only sustain what we undertook to do with the support of the members. And I believe we have received this support and the support will always be forthcoming. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, President Nelson Harvey. And I think one point you quickly raised is the obligation of the members of the society. I think um, at some point, members think that this is a role for the presidents only. And um, yet it's very key in aspects of rule of law to have the support of, of, the, of the membership, realizing the importance that the rule of law, of law plays in both our practice. I think one of the questions that is being asked is what, what are we going to do about it? And, and I think I would like to ask every bar president to just share an idea. Uh, but I will mention that as East Africa Law Society, we have constituted the East Africa Law Society Rule of Law Committee, um, chaired by Professor Sempewa, and uh, has representation from all the bars, including civil society and young lawyers. So we hope that this East Africa Law Society Rule of Law Committee is going to be able to contribute and advise the council on what actions we shall take uh, together. You will also note that as East Africa Law Society, uh, we issued a statement, for instance, in respect to the Uganda elections. Uh, this statement was issued by all the presidents of the bar, and we intend to continue working together towards realizing um, the 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 fight for the rule of law in the region. So I will ask, start with, uh, let me see, is President Fiona Wall on? Yes, I am. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. How um, do you think I think out? one, pardon? Beg your pardon, do you want to reshape it? 
Yes, yes. No, maybe let me shape, let me reshape it. How do you see this playing out, and what can we do uh, together? First of all, I just wanted to say something about the need for us to be concerted, and I thank you, President Bernard, for joining us in that way. One, why why am I saying this? We've seen. I beg your pardon for the noise in the background. We've seen a lot of countries, we've seen many countries now. Uh, what's unique about Uganda is that during the elections there was an internet blackout and this has become habit from last year. And now we're seeing other countries, uh, even Western countries, copying this very, very bad habit. Uh, this means that these, these human rights, um, Contraventions by the state can be habitual, can be caught, uh, they are contagious, and that is why we should not sit and wait and be at peace when one state is suffering, uh, especially an immediately neighboring state. But we've also seen a lot of, and this is maybe a challenge to the East African Law Society, we've seen a lot of issues around trade, uh, the border relationships, uh, that are going that are contradicting our vision of integration and um, I think that one of the things we can do right now is to document the beauty about human rights abuses is that they never they don't have a limitation period so let's document these things uh, let's also utilize the East African Court of Justice. There are so many places in which our states might not respond, our judiciaries might be weak, uh, but we have the East African Court of Justice and it's quite neutral and I think uh, has more courage by virtue of its position to, to give us what would call um, jurisprudence of, of, of a transformative nature uh, where human rights are concerned. So. I think one of the things is to document, two, let's make use of our East African Court of Justice, but three, let's be part of the conversation. Let our bar associations get involved in um, actual uh, calling the state to account. And I want to applaud Kenya in that element. Thank you. Thank you, President Fiona Wall. I would also just ask President Julian Batonier, um, what, what what are your views in respect to the remedies? I think that's a question that is being asked in the chat. It's, um, thank you, President. It's doing what we are already doing now. It's first of all discussing and exchanging on what is happening in the region. We may not be exhaustive within two hours with uh, six, seven president of the bar, but a discussion among ourselves in each bar association Every time a lawyer has an issue, he can raise that issue to our committee, if not to the president of the bar or a member of the governing council or the law society. That's one, identification of issues. So we've been saying that it's accountability. If uh, we have an issue of accountability, we, it can be an officer. And then you raise the question to the head of the institution, the police head of the uh, Rwanda Investigation Bureau or Uganda, Kenya, et cetera. If you see that there is no response, then it became an institution and maybe that you have to address. But if that matter is solved, it's a matter of training of the officers who are not aware of the rights of advocate, of the right of accessing justice. And uh, if it is parliament that is enacting legislation that are changing every year or every two years, that, then it's a matter of discussing with the speaker, with uh, members of uh, parliament that are former advocate or are still a member of the Bar Association or the Law Society, that discussion, they end up understanding that you're not just criticizing, you just want to move forward for a positive note. And if you bring in on the, on the table that this legislation has been changing after one year, another one has been changing, that uh, we could address these things at the same time, you can see some piece of legislation changing every six months or every one year. Once we can sit for three months and discuss, and we have a legislation that can spend five years by, by being uh, relevant. So independence of judges, this is a matter of, uh, there is always priorities. What we identify is that when there is a need and the will, we always find solution. We see the budget of uh, fighting cor Even in Europe, they have been finding money that they didn't fund for, for social, 
uh, needs that they, they had in, in their jurisdiction. But if justice become uh, a priority area, I'm sure if there is a need and the will, we fund budget for, the, for those judges, for their independence, for the equipment they need to make sure that the online, uh, online hearing will be an easier thing for them and for us as advocate. Access to justice, you'll be having access to justice sitting in your office or sitting in your jurisdiction and having a hearing in your office. Those are the things that are happening in Kigali, but in the rural area is still challenging. So we are quite happy of what is happening in town that you can sit at home and have a conversation like the one we have now, but with a judge uh, in uh, some uh, issues of accessing like uh, people detained, having a test COVID and accessing your client can be one of the solution that can be provided. But this means that you have to have some money like $10 for the lawyer to be able to make that uh, rapid test and access your client. So it's solution by discussing with the judiciary, discussing with the parliament, discussing with uh, members of the Senate in Rwanda, the Ministry of Justice, of course, and engaging the Ministry of Finance because it's also an issue of money. If they have a willing and the Ministry of Finance is saying we don't have the cash, it became an issue. We can help them to make it understand, understood that it's a matter of uh, priority. The justice we need, it's a justice that is not delayed. It's an efficient ju justice. It's independence of, ju of judges. It's accountability. So for saving time, I will be stopping there. And, uh, Thank you, Batonier. Um, I think your thoughts are well received uh, about what more we can do. I will ask the president, uh, Dr. Shala, to also just share his thoughts on what more we can do. And I think one of the questions being asked to you, doctor, is why was uh, advocate Fatuma Karume uh, struck from the role of advocates at, TL at TLS? And increasingly, I think you can deal with the question of we also see increasing arrest of, of lawyers for just doing their job. And that's also a very critical issue that is happening within the region. We need to have some sort of action against um, against those sort of actions that are being visited onto our members. Dr. Shala? Yes, yes, I can hear you. It's from one place to, to another. So basically, I will not put myself on, on the on the on video. But uh, basically, Madam Fatma Karume was uh, was suspended and even was declared removed from the from the bar by the Advocates Committee, which is mandated by the Advocates uh, Act to sort of a, a, a disciplinary organ of the, of the, of the government or of the court to deal with uh, complaints against the advocates. But uh, what was quite uh, upsetting or intriguing, the fact that uh, you are dealing with uh, somebody who was acting as an advocate. So I think brought, uh, in, in, in your final submissions, I think she wrote some some words which were the attorney general was not comfortable. The attorney general here was being prosecuted against the individual in his personal capacity, but he complained and the, the, the presiding judge while delivering his uh, ruling on what supplemental objection, basically said yes, I'm going to give her a, a, an opportunity to be aired, but in the meantime she's uh, she's suspended, and the matter is supposed to be referred to the advocates committee. So before the Advocates Committee took up the matter, the Attorney General lodged another fresh complaint before, before it, before the Advocates Committee, uh, and bring so many other things. So eventually the Advocates Committee ruled against Madam Fatma, and the, Madam Fatma was saying she was protesting her innocence, but in, and also she was, she, was, she, was, uh, she, she accused the, the Advocates Committee of not being independent enough and being a biased uh, uh, committee. So they ruled against her and uh, we are now, she filed an appeal before the High Court where we have a panel of three judges and uh, that's where we are. We expect that uh, the appeal is coming on, on the 24th. So I will not talk very much about, uh, about the matter because I'm also an advocate involved in, in, in our appeal. So that's a kind of, but uh, we thought that uh, as a bar association, we said we, we have to stand up with our member and uh, 
he persuaded her to appeal and eventually she agreed that yes, she was going to appeal. And uh, so we, are, we, we, we survived the three not points of criminal objection that the, the government uh, uh, had lodged. So the High Court uh, overruled those three points of objection. So the matter is now before the, the High Court of Tanzania. So that's, that's, the, that's the case. But uh, one can now, if you can be accused of, uh, of uh, whatever you write in, in your final submissions, then if those can, can be used against you and be, be taken as a, as a reason of you being, being bad, then that sends a quite a cheering message to each and every advocate that basically you must, you cannot defend your, your clients vigorously as, as is supposed to be the case. Dr. Shala, okay. We lost him. Dr. Shala could have lost him. I think we will come back to him when we finally get to him. I think he was finishing his presentation on uh, on uh, Advocate Fatuma Karume. Hello, I, I think, I, I don't know, I was cut off. Somebody was calling me and then he, he, he he basically, the, the internet just went, went off. So basically right. I'm saying as, as East African Law Society, we must come together. Mm. We must come together in the sense that we must work together in fighting for the rule of law. What is happening in Tanzania should not be left to Tanzanians alone, but we as a regional body must come together and basically voice our, our concerns. What, what, what I think we tried la last, last, last month during the Ugandan elections where basically we, we, we we came, uh, we, the East African Law Society issued a, a statement. Now, those are supposed to be quite frequent, well informed, they must be able to be issued at, 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 at the right moment and ensuring that we are, we are together. Then, of course, as, as my colleagues have, have suggested, we must utilize the full East African Court of Justice and also even the African Court. Then, also, the, the UN mechanisms, uh, UN mechanisms ensuring that we are able to. Uh, to, to, to put to shame uh, our, our countries or our leaders or individuals that are basically transgressing uh, uh, human rights. So we should not shy away from using all those, those means. But again, then let's, let's also see a way of using the social media to basically voice our, uh, our to, to, to put people on alert, to alert people on, on the human rights violations uh, and the uh, rule of law violations. Then. Uh, ensuring that people are put, uh, 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 put uh, 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 on speed uh, on the issues in the international community is alerted about what all that is happening. We must basically mobilize the shame into ensuring that uh, these things are not, uh, are not, are not, are not uh, uh, the order of, of the day. But then we should use try, I think we need to, to engage our judiciaries. Uh, our judges and the magistrates, I think they might need some more training on, the, on the, the rule of law, what, what it means. Because some people, I think, when they might have studied it in the first year or second year of their law school, uh, then after that, they have never and appreciated the meaning of the rule of the law. Uh, the rule of law is a, is, a, is a tool that binds the country together. If we don't have the rule of the law, then you are basically uh, advocating for anarchy. In the judiciary, it will be the first culprit. Uh, because if, they, if people don't have uh, don't have any trust in the in the, in the, the judicial system, basically, it's a, you are you are inviting people to go to the bush. Our colleagues in Uganda, seven said they went to the bush. So you might you are telling people also go to the bush, uh, and uh, some some people don't understand that what it means. So we need to fight for the rule of law, like as if as if our lives depend on it, and for sure our lives depend on the rule of law. Otherwise, we can't exist as a civil society. You want to have a well-functioning economy if you don't have the rule of the law. So business people require rule of law. We as lawyers, rule of law. Doctors need the rule of law. Everybody in, 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 in our countries 
require a well-functioning rule of law so system. That's what I can say. Thank you, Dr. Shala, for that for the, for your bold remarks, and I think we and we we all agree we have to fight for the rule of law. We have to fight for this space, and um, using the East African Law Society, we will do that and try and push and see how far we can go. President Harvey, um, when do we protest? When do we go to the street? Is that also a remedy? <laughs> Well, uh, there is a popular meme in Kenya of General Chai Guevara, which is quite uh, <laughs> appropriate to your question, when do we protest? The, the, the COVID-19 regulations have been abused by, by the East African states to curtail some of uh, the rights that are available in manifestation of, uh, of protest. And I remember at one point in time, I spoke to President Fiona Wall and told her, much as that is a very available means, for now it may end up being disastrous to our members. But that does not mean we must uh, shy away from protesting if there is need for us to protest. I will quote what uh, Chief Justice Emeritus of uh, the Republic of Kenya, David Kenani Maraga said about the rule of law. He said, the biggest casualties when the rule of law fails are lawyers, judges and magistrates. Because if we were to go to the jungle as President Yoweri Museveni says, then the, the courts will be dysfunctional. What about doctors, engineers? they'll be the biggest beneficiaries because they will be treating those who are injured in war. The engineers will be making tanks and weapons. So it is very imperative as lawyers we realize that uh, as legal practitioners, we are the biggest beneficiaries of the rule of law. And there is nobody who is better placed than us to speak or to act. And notwithstanding any limitations, if necessary, we should always be available to protest to boycott, but at all times acting within the law and ensuring that our voices are heard and our actions are felt. Thank you. President Bernard, may I say something? President Bernard, you are muted. We, we can't hear you and President Wall would like to speak. Oh, all right. Yes, I was muted. Thank you, President Harvey. I was waiting for you to direct us to go to the street. Mm -hmm. You seem to have uh, taken a of view. Uh, knowing that we can always learn from Kenya, given your advanced democracy. But we're, what we are now clearly seeing in terms of the Building Bridges Initiative, we see that there is intolerance to dissenting views. Um, and that is that we are clearly seeing. I think that is going to be something to watch out for in the next uh, one year. I think when the referendum does happen, if it happens, and the elections. Uh, President Fiona, you wanted to say something? Let me give you. Yes, thank you, Bernard. Uh, thank you, President Bernard. Uh, we somebody asked on the on on the q a and i think we missed it out on about the mri uh, sorry the mra the mutual recognition agreements and the progress and i thought that this would be a good opportunity to call on all of us uh, as presidents of the bar associations and of course you as our head to to look into seriously uh, achieving this because um most of the protocols have not been signed there have been problems at, at the beginning, all the presidents were on board. Uh, it was only our attorney generals that were dragging their feet, but uh, then at some point, even some of the presidents fell off. So I think uh, just to let members know where we, we are at, we are still, uh, I think, waiting at the ELS level for a joint resolution and we all sign. Um, that's where it's at right now. Thank you, President Wall. <clears throat> we will have another webinar discussing East African integration <clears throat> and the MRA, and that is why I was uh, 
avoiding that question for now as we speak about rule of law. Thank you for your response to it. And I think we will have that detailed discussion on the challenges uh, so that we can be able to progress. Just before we proceed, I would like to give uh, uh, Mr. Donald there um, a couple of minutes just to discuss about the trend on rule of law in Africa. Uh, Donald has been the CEO of uh, East Africa Law Society. He has also been the C. He's also currently the CEO of Pan African Lawyers Union. Uh, so, where he sits, he's able to see the trend um, and 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 what is happening in terms of rule of law within Africa. Let me give you a couple of minutes to just say something about what you're seeing and what your uh, suggestions could be. Thank you very much, Mr. President uh, Bernard Oundo, and also all our presidents on the call, President Fiona Wall, uh, President Julien Kavaruganda, uh, uh, President um, uh, Nshala Rugemeleza, who's my host president in terms of my office, and my own president of my parent bar, President Nelson Harvey. Uh, thank you for having this uh, conversation that is led by the apex leadership of the formal bar associations uh, in the region. Thank you very much and congratulations for taking uh, this opportunity to reinvigorate the committees of the East Africa Law Society and especially to uh, establish the rule of law committee led by our eminent president emeritus, Professor Fred Sempebwa. Indeed, the challenges that the region and the continent generally are facing are unprecedented. And we also have to take measures that are unprecedented, that are novel, that we've never done before, if indeed we are able to, we are, we are to be able to respond uh, and protect our members and protect the citizens of the region. Uh, with regard to your question, President uh, uh, Bernard, what is happening in East Africa is pretty much what is happening in the rest of Africa. Only in the rest of Africa, at least we can talk of some best practices that we're seeing in a couple of places. In Botswana, for instance, where the president of the Republic made it very clear from early March last year that any measures that would be taken uh, by the government would be completely within the rule of law, would follow the constitution, would be brought to the floor of parliament, and would make sure that the measures that are taken are proportionate and are not disproportionate with regard to the effects on the people. And he has pretty much kept that promise 12 months later. We could talk of the best practice of Malawi, where even in the middle of COVID, uh, and with uh, serious executive intimidation, the apex uh, uh, judiciary, the Court of Appeal, stood up to the intimidation and gave the best decision it could in the circumstances with regard to the presidential election petition. And we ended up going back into an election and the government changed. That's a best practice of a court that has stood up to executive intimidation. We can talk of a good practice in Ghana, which recently held its peaceful election. Nothing is perfect anywhere, but relatively peaceful. And whereas uh, the losing uh, uh, coalition uh, in the presidential election disputed the result, we are having a peaceful presidential election petition going on. Quite the opposite where we are seeing in Uganda where the military is still on the streets uh, and is really just intimidating citizens, abducting you know, people, disappearing people, torturing people, people turning up severely injured and so on. But we've also seen quite a number of bad practices also on the continent. For instance, you could talk of Cote d'Ivoire where the outgoing president after having his two terms uh, launched upon a controversial interpretation of the constitution to run for a third term, which he then was declared to have won. You notice that our lexicon has changed. We, in most African countries, we never talk anymore that so-and-so won. All we say is that the election commission declared you because everything else is glaring. We can see, you know, about the bad practice in Guinea where the president has also insisted on a controversial amendment to the constitution to create a third term, which he then was declared winner of. Uh, we've seen massively excessive use of force uh, in Cameroon uh, in dealing with the dispute uh, involving Anglo from Cameroon. But even in countries that are not at war, like Nigeria, in dealing with uh, COVID-19. 
I would say at the continental level, the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Africa CDC, which is the specialist agency of the AU, has exhibited exemplary leadership on the medical aspects of COVID-19 in terms of bringing together the medical establishments, the governmental medical establishments of our countries together, in terms of having a team that interprets for Africa what is going on, in terms of collecting statistics and trends from within the continent, and in terms of providing gu guidance in how medically we should deal with COVID-19. Unfortunately, the other organs of the AU, especially the African Union Commission and the African Union Peace and Security Council, have been unable to rise up to the occasion with regard to uh, the myriad violations of our civil rights, our political rights, our economic, social, and cultural rights, and even our rights to participate effectively in the governance of our countries through elections in this period. So there's a lot of work that ought to be done there to really strengthen these institutions, to make them be able to rise up to moments of crisis like this, which is why we established them in the first place. So I'll just end again by congratulating you. I know you have requested I and my colleague to sit in the rule of law committee under the chairpersonship of Professor Sempebwa. And just like President Wall said, let's all work together. And President uh, 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 Nshala Rugemeleza said, let's all band together now and not just the elected leadership of the legal profession or the employed staff of the secretariat, such as myself, but together with our members all over the region, let's rise up now, hold hands together, form a strong chain link in order to protect and defend our rights and the rights of our people. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Don, for that excellent presentation. I think we can see the experience on the continent. I would like to ask Professor Sempewa to share his thoughts. You've um, had the discussion from the Bali does. You've had what the status is looking like. Um, I would like you to share your, your thoughts uh, since, the, since it's now four o'clock and I, I think it will also be your closing remarks. I'll also ask the other presidents after our guest speaker has shared his thoughts to also share their closing remarks. Thank you. Professor Sempewa, please. Professor Sempewa. I think while we try, he, while I will ask him to reconnect, possibly he, he's not able to hear us. Professor Sempewa, can you hear me? Now I can hear you, but I'd lost oh. you. Wow, oh, okay, okay. I was asking you, Professor, to share your thoughts. You've had the status um, of the rule of law in our respective countries. You've been in the business of advancing the cause of rule of law uh, for a long time. Uh, what quick thoughts can you share uh, with the Bar leaders and the East African Law Society for purposes of dealing with what is happening? I'll also ask you to share up your closing remarks um as you do that thank you um thank you very much i must uh, apologize i lost connection for about uh, six minutes and i i lost uh, a bit of what uh, has been discussed there's been some internet interference so i may not uh, be able to uh, comment on everything but I, from what I attended, from what I heard, uh, there is really a, a convergence of views on what is happening and what uh, the membership of the respective bars separately and uh, jointly uh, under East African Law Society can do. But before I, I make my comments, I would like to share some of the views on elections in this region. 
there is uh, a pattern of similarity when uh, the election season comes, a pattern of similarity of action in, in uh, our respective states. Uh, we've had an election in Burundi, an election in Tanzania, and we are just completing an election in Uganda. Um, an election as a uh, the president of the Tanganyika Law Society has said is a very important thing for the rule of law because this is where the people exercise their sovereignty and they confer mandate on representatives to ensure their well being, to ensure that uh, they are treated under conditions of justice and they have equal opportunities. But uh, it's a worrying trend that elections are turning into uh, uh, civil strife wars. So, as uh, members of the of the of the respective bars and the East African Law Society, I think we have a lot to do in trying to ensure in ensuring that uh, uh, democracy prevails. One of the problems we're experiencing in Uganda, I've listened to all the others, you know, the lack of uh, um, independent election management bodies, uh, interference by the security agents in elections and so on. But one of the problems we're facing in Uganda is that uh, um, politics has become an investment. Uh, because being a representative of the people is no longer a service, but some investment, uh, which uh, uh, from which you, uh, uh, the successful candidate must recoup profits. And therefore it becomes uh, a real strife for people to be uh, elected. Money now is what determines representation. Money and other, 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 other factors uh, like the use of force and so on and so on. I think we need to fight to uh, give education to our people uh, who are always at election seasons are always uh, now trained in receiving benefits of this and that. And in return, they expect that the representative uh, has the capacity to give them personal services and remedies for personal matters, like a treatment of their children and so on and so on. And this goes not only at the parliamentary or district level, but goes up to the top uh, where, where are the, the, the president is now seen as the overall conferral of benefits of any type. So we need to engage in, a, in a, a, um, sensitization of the people to get out of this um, attitude that uh, their representative pays them and they expect personal benefits out of it. And on the other hand, the representative must recoup the investment through being susceptible to bribes of the other organs of the state, especially the executive. Uh, and, and the end result that we are not served. So it's, it's a worrying trend. However, going back to the rule of law, uh, I, I, I appreciate what the respective bars are doing. Uh, under ELS, uh, we have always uh, tried to do advocacy and I think we should intensify our advocacy role. We should also intensify our action intervention um, through challenges to um, abuses of the rule of law through challenges to laws that are not conformity with the, with the, with the principles of the rule of law. Uh, we have done this before. We have uh, had uh, uh, 
um, a litigation team that uh, has done a, lot, a bit of litigation before the East African uh, Court of Justice. It's simply that in the last two or three years, it has not been possible, maybe through a lack of uh, funding and so on, to uh, approach the East African Court of Justice uh, more frequently than what, what, what we did before. But a number of, uh, a lot of jurisprudence at the East African Court of Justice originates from the East African Law Society as Donald Dea there will bear me uh, witness. And we should continue in this area. Uh, I, I've had uh, the talk about East African Court of Justice, uh, lacking uh, judges, the need for appointments and so on. Uh, that's an area again for us to sim simply not agitate for appointment of judges, but a restructuring of the entire court and actually restructuring of the entire East African community. Otherwise, if we are going to continue having uh, uh, five, six gentlemen deciding uh, affairs of the community and rest restraining from deciding affairs of the community at will, then we are not going anywhere. And this is what how the East African community number one collapsed. So even in respect of the court, I think we should agitate for a, a system of uh, transparent, competitive appointment of judges uh, who should preside at a permanent, uh, uh, permanently in this court because the volume of work has increased and is going to increase. Um, so we, have, we should take an interest in the East African community generally. Uh, and the East African Court of Justice is one most important to us, but to the community at large, because this is the most integrative organ of the, of, of the community. The others are constituted of delegates of, of, of the respective states. So, uh, we have a long way to go. Um, we cannot say that uh, the situation is rosy, that matters are fine. Uh, we can only congratulate ourselves on the little that we have achieved, but actually resolve that we become more and more active uh, in the interest of uh, of, uh, of the people of the region. It's, it's going to be a, a difficult situation now that the community is growing. We've been joined by, by South, South Sudan. Uh, and as you are aware, uh, the situation in South Sudan is a bit precarious. Um, we, there is a tendency to believe that South Sudan is still far away from us and we shouldn't be concerned with it. But that is not the case. It's, 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 it's around the corner. Anything that goes wrong in South Sudan affects uh, our areas in Uganda, uh, Kenya, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and the Congo, which is also trying to join the, the, the community. The spillover can then go on to other uh, other partner states. I would like to thank you, Mr. President, for organizing this webinar, and also for you and your council to take the initiative to put in place a rule of law uh, committee of the ELS. I would like to thank the respective, the bars of the respective, the heads of the respective bars uh, in the region for their commitment to the rule of law, for their courage in advocating for it, and for their resolve to intervene whenever it's necessary. I would also like to thank all the participants. We would have liked to hear more from you participants, but we hope 
uh, this will be for the future. This having been an inaugural webinar, we we'll expect um, in the future, of course, there will be more longer notices and preparations so that we can have uh, a truly participatory uh, dialogue. Thank you very much. Those are my concluding remarks, and uh, I hand you over. I hand over to you, uh, chair of the webinar, and the organizers for the next. Thank you, Professor, for your thoughts on what more we can do. And I think we are, we, are, we are glad and humbled that you accepted to chair the rule of law committee. So I think we will continue to push that agenda. Let me quickly ask President Nelson Harvey to give his concluding remarks um, on this conversation. Uh, thank you, friends. Uh, I, I believe uh, I've said much insofar as the rule of law is concerned. Just to reiterate that it should not be lost during our watch. And uh, to, to, to that end, it's imperative that we encourage our members to realize that the responsibility of making it work cannot be limited to the leaders elected or appointed, but is a communal responsibility. If we fail to do that, history will judge us unfairly and to use uh, the, the, the same example that Professor Pebo has told us, that it not go as East African Community One went. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Harvey. Let me ask Dr. Shala, President Shala to share his closing remarks. Hello, I'm just to wish to thank each and everyone for taking part into this, for the ELS, for Mr. President, for organizing, for Barbara, also being a, a, behind the move. So I think it's a good start. Let us continue working together. Let us explore more facets of the rule of law and let us pursue them. So I hope, as we've been promised, that even our members will be able to participate in the future webinars. So let us do them. Otherwise, I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shala. Uh, let me ask President Batone, Julian, could you please give your closing remarks? Uh, thank you, President. It's uh, just an internal dialogue that we have to have with members uh, in each law society or bar association. And therefore, on the level of ELS, it's now in place, a dialogue with university student and DLP program on the rule of law, because then we'll be able to identify issues followed by uh, isolating issues by issue and then treating them. So that will be a good way of uh, discussing identification of issues, finding solution that has been identified elsewhere and uh, implementation in our jurisdiction. Thank you. Thank you so much, Batonier. Um, I think we could have lost President Wall. She's not on. Okay, let me take the opportunity to thank um, everyone who has attended this. Maybe I'll just ask my CEO Huntington, just one minute, just say something so that we can be able to close this discussion. Thank you, Mr. President. and. Uh... I appreciate uh, the very welcoming, refreshing discussion that you've had this afternoon. And quite, you know, it's quite uh, reassuring. The last three and a half years or four, Don and I have been fighting monsters in the name of rule of law. And we've been thinking that we are losing the grip on it in East Africa. We saw what happened in Tanzania in the election. Uh, Uganda followed closely. And before that, we saw what had happened in Kenya. It's not just on human rights. We are looking at independence of the judiciary at the same time where Kenya was a real culprit. We know what's going on in Burundi. We saw what happened around the election. And not that Rwanda is very much safe. We believe uh, still the people don't have voices enough to speak. And in South Sudan, 
you know, uh, extrajudicial executions are the order of the day. And we believe that uh, these are things, the conversation will be carried forward and more and more with the work of the rule and law committee and uh, the presidents of national bar, we should be able to open that space more. If lawyers can speak, then we believe we can create voices for the ordinary people to speak. Thank you so much, even Mr. President, and for the organization, David and the Secretariat too, for the support. Thank you, thank you, Huntington. I cannot finish this conversation without giving a minute to Donald. Don, please just in one minute as we close, please say something, your closing remarks. Thank you very much, Mr. President, once more for hosting this debate, for initiating this. Uh, I think as my brother CEO has said, and as the president had said before, there's a lot of work to be done, but we are committed and we are re-energized by the initiative that you have started to do what we can uh, as soon as we can. And uh, on behalf of the leadership of the Pan-African Lawyers Union, uh, we just wish you, our members, the East African Law Society, the institutional members and the individual members, uh, all, gold, all Godspeed and uh, best wishes as you embark on this important work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don. Let me take the opportunity to thank all the panelists today. I want to thank the presidents of the bars. Thank you so much for sparing time to discuss rule of law. I want to thank Professor Sempewa. As always, whenever you're called upon, you always um, are available. Thank you for continuing to, to spearhead this fight on rule of law. Um, let me thank all the attendees, our members. We thank you so much. Uh, for attending this inaugural webinar. Our commitment to you is that we will continue to advance the cause of the rule of law. And the committee chaired by Professor Sempe is going to organize more webinars on rule of law uh, so that we can be able to engage in a more participatory manner. Thank you once again. Let me wish all of you a nice weekend and a nice evening. Thank you. <laughs>